Hi, and welcome to Hiss and Tell, a cat behavior and more podcast, hosted by me, Christina Wilson, animal behaviorist. Before we lost Steve and Mimi, I had never even heard of a veterinary chaplain, and I didn't know that spiritual care was available for those of us going through the loss of a beloved animal. And so I'm really excited to share today's episode with you guys. I spoke with veterinary chaplains, Dr. Rob Gierka and Karen Duke. So let's get into it. And if you're grieving, I hope you're able to get some help and resources out of this episode. Hi, uh, welcome to another episode of Hiss and Tell. I am your host, Christina Wilson. And with me today is Dr. Rob Gerka, the founder and president of PetChaplain.com and Karen Duke, senior vice president of PetChaplain.com. Welcome, you guys. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate having you here. Oh, thank you for having us. Thanks, Christina. So can you tell me a little bit about what it is that you do and what inspired you to become a veterinary chaplain? Well, I I uh, grew up in a big family, Catholic family, and we had a lot of pets. My mom was a pet person, and uh, at one time I think we had 14 cats, including three litters of kittens, a couple of dogs, two rabbits, a bunch of gerbils, and that was the environment that that I grew up in. Oh, and 10 kids, that too. Oh, wow. (laughs) Did I say we were Catholic? Yes, very Catholic, yes. And, uh, you know, my mom loved animals. She was always putting food out to feed them, so we were getting more and more all the time. And uh, so I learned um, to love animals, but Mm -hmm. also learned how it feels when you lose them. Yes. And it's very, very painful. And I've had a lot of experiences of losing pets and having to deal with the consequences. And so that got me interested early, at an early age, in the idea of compassion. So I have a story when I was about 14 Fred, uh, not Freddie, Freddie's mom. She didn't have a name because she was feral. Mm -hmm. She got into our basement and had two kittens. One of them... Peanut. Was named We named Peanut because she was a little yellow cat. Mm -hmm. And she uh, was like shaped like a peanut. You could hold her in your hand, you know. And then there was uh, Freddie. Freddie was pretty robust and he took the food and ate. But Peanut wasn't. Peanut was uh, always frail. But I kept trying to feed her and so I would go and she would sit by the fridge right where the hot air came out at the Mm -hmm. bottom yeah and i would pick her up and feed her whatever i could a little piece of turkey or something and but one day i noticed she was wheezing so we took her to the vet my mom my mom and i drove actually i was older than i think i was older i was probably about 18 i think i just got my license right anyway i drove mom to the vet and it had a huge impact on me i think it was my first time at the vet we couldn't afford to go to the vet, really, mostly because you know, we just didn't have that kind of money. But sure. she took Peanut in, and uh, the vet said, well, she's got pneumonia, and um, see, we're probably going to have to put her down. And I protested, and, and the vet said, well, okay, we can, give, we can either give her this shot to put her to sleep, or we can give her some penicillin. And my mother voted for the penicillin. And I was very happy about that, because I thought we'd give her a chance. Yeah. Well... Peanut didn't make it. And by the time we got her home, she was gone. I'm so sorry. And uh, but that that really touched me because one, the vet gave us a choice, and I appreciated the vet. And uh, um, my mom chose life, and in a compassionate response, and that that made me think. And so that's kind of where it started. Me trying to think about what it feels like to lose animals and what we can do, you know, as professionals, as and as uh, pet owners or pet keepers, we like to say to help. Thank you for sharing that. I can really see and hear how affected you still are. It's, you know, I, I am. And when I talk about these stories, I sometimes I'm put back into that circumstance. And I know that, uh, grief lasts a long time. So, you know, we, we work with each other in those moments to try to get through it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. It was that was very touching. Karen, do you want to share what sure. inspired I you? I won't tell a sad story. Um, mine is more. I met Rob back in 2012, and um, we hit it off right away. And I was really intrigued by his work at that point. See, 2012, he had established Pet Chaplain, founded Pet Chaplain in 2004, and I was just 
I'd always had animals in my life, you know, grew up with animals like Rob did and like many mm -hmm. of us did. And I was just really intrigued by it. And um, he, he uh, Rob had, um, and still is, uh, facilitating a pet loss support group through the SPCA. And so I started joining him in those support groups and learning more and more about his work. And at that time, he was in the midst of finishing up a doctoral degree in adult education, and he had a research focus on pet loss and mm -hmm. bereavement. And so as part of that, he had um, interviewed uh, 16 veterinary technology students about pets that they had loved and lost, and he was really interested. The focus of the study was how did their experiences with their pets influence their career choice? And I, I did the transcriptions for those and just fell in love, just absolutely fell in love with these animal, you know, these aspiring veterinary professionals. Just fantastic, amazing stories of how influential their experiences with their pets, um, most of them when they were children, but not all of them. Some of them had acquired these special pets when they were adults. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was just... I, I'm a storyteller, I'm a writer and a graphic designer and, an, and a painter, and I just love the stories. And, you know, we went from there. And when he finished his degree, we took a few, he took a few years off. It was a long slog to getting through the doctoral degree. Yeah. And that's when we decided to start an online course in, in um, veterinary chaplaincy. And um, I should also mention Rob had trained as a chaplain at a human hospital. So mm -hmm. he had those, you know, the spiritual skill and background in interface spiritual care. So we were able to put together a course. We didn't charge anything. We really just wanted to see what would happen. We didn't promote it. We got that first time, I think we had a six week course and mm -hmm. we incorporated some of the research that Rob had done for, for his uh, dissertation, as well as the stories about the pets from the vet techs. And it just took off from there. I mean, it was just the most amazing experience. Somehow people found us, and we found that there was a real interest in this. And um, it, so by the time we, we taught for five years, and by the time we decided we could put the course on hold, we had, we're probably training 30 students at a time, oh. and which was it was a very intensive experience because it's very small, a lot of small group right. work, a lot of talking about our pets and the stories and our own experiences with pets, which is an important part of chaplaincy education, and we can get to that. But that was it. I mean, I re honestly felt like I had no background in, you know, any kind of caregiving role, but it was so compelling, and the people I met, just the most amazing, wonderful, compassionate people, these animal lovers, mm -hmm. and... Um, it, I, I felt like I had put my toe in a river and just got whoosh. <laughs> and that's what it still feels like because it's just so compelling and so needed. And I was just so moved. But, you know, and so we put the course on hold and now we're taking all the written lectures we developed over that five years and um, created, a, now we're creating a book series. Amazing. Because we really want to bring this message to as many people as possible. That, that, I think it, it's, that's amazing. And I think it's so needed. I think, obviously, I think everyone, especially listening to this podcast, knows that pet loss grief is often so disenfranchised and it can be so yeah. lonely and so difficult for people. So I think the more tools and the more help that we have can only benefit people struggling with this often much deeper grief than people expect. So yes. mm -hmm. um, how would you describe the role of a veterinary chaplain to someone who has never heard of this before? Because I do think it's something that's kind of new to people. Well, Karen mentioned the, the chaplaincy training that I had at um, in the hospital, yes. a clinical pastoral education. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a clinical program for hospital chaplains. But um, in that program, uh, I learned quite a bit about um, grief and responding to grief. Um, and one of the things that I did, and this was really started uh, when I, I wrote my dissertation, I came up with a method of interviewing that I use for the vet techs, but now I also use in my work, uh, which we call the chaplain C's. C standing for the connection, the communication with others, and coping. 
So it helps to have some framework when you're engaging because, you know, it can be an emotional experience for the care provider as well. Of course. As the person, you know, so if, you, if you're attached to animals and you're trying to be a, a caring presence for someone, you can be triggered by your own grief. So we give people this structure that helps, that helps them to, at least it gives them categories of areas of discussion. Talk mm-hmm. about the connection with your pet. What was that like? You know, how wonderful was your animal exactly? Tell us more about that. And people, you know, people will talk about their pet, and it's a wonderful thing. But then we try to probe in the, in the social area. And we, we know that many of the issues that come up for a grieving person can spring from either a disconnect or a lack of connection with mm-hmm. um, their social networks or, or, a, or a, a reduced time in response. So right. Sometimes people, after two weeks, you know, people find that others are less likely to ask them how they're doing. Yes. So uh, we, we go there and the social, we talk about that, find out what's it like at church, what's it like at school, at work, at home, you know, who, who's helping you, who's, who's supporting you in this? And often we find that, that people are grieving alone. And then the last C of, of the structure is the uh, coping. What, what helps? We mm-hmm. ask what helps. You know, how, can, uh, how can we improve that? And uh, we talk about that. And so it's, it's really kind of, it's about reframing. Here's what exists. Here's the reality. And so how can we look at this maybe in a way that might make you feel a little more comforted? So that's what we do. And um, this is primarily a, a process that we have in the books and that we used in our class and we teach our students. Right. Um, yeah, and I will say, too, on, a, on kind of a high level, like what do pet chaplains or veterinary chaplains do? So right. what Rob mentioned with this storytelling method that you would use in, say, one-on-one conversations. If, say, you're in a busy veterinary hospital and somebody is just really struggling with, um, you know, euthanizing their pet, and, you know, very often you may not have very long to spend with them, maybe mm-hmm. 15 to 30 minutes in a busy clinic. And and so this this method is actually based on kind of part of the crisis intervention techniques that people use in those situations. So that's mm-hmm. that's one-on-one kind of conversation. But being spiritual caregivers, the, you also might get involved in creating rituals and memorials or eulogies right. for animals. So that's another important service. And I think and we can talk more about that. It's so important to take that time to remember to remember right to yes pause and so that's another thing and just the process of talking with someone and sharing you know if i've lost my pet and talking with a sympathetic listener is really curious about my story and it, it it's a wonderful way to just telling your story to someone who really is sympathetic and empathetic with what you're experiencing is very healing in itself. And then also sometimes chaplains can play a leadership role. You can imagine how difficult it was, say, during COVID <clears throat> in veterinary clinics with all of the pressures that that brought on and mm-hmm. people not being able to be with their pets. That a presence of a really calm chaplain who people for staff, you know, staff support, that's really, really important. And um, same would apply in rescue organizations that you might, you know, pull everyone together for a uh, just a collective prayer. You can frame it as a prayer or a secular reflection. You know, we're very we're very flexible. So you're, right. you're really, this the care that you provide is is driven by the needs of the person you're working with. Of course. So that leads me into, and I know we've already touched on it a little bit, but what kind of training or certification is required to do? what you guys do to be a veterinary chaplain? Um, Well, I'll take that one. There really is no certification, true certification program Mm. at this point. This field is so new. When we taught our course, we didn't promise people that we were certifying because certifying would imply, you know, a a governing body. Yeah. Governing body, exactly. I mean, professional chaplains who work in hospitals go through hundreds and hundreds of hours of client care right. and extended units and study, you know, before they become board certified. So we don't promise that, but we have provided a very thorough education. And what we've developed now is we've kind of identified seven key competencies mm-hmm. that our book series addresses. And, and of course, Reading a book is not the same as practicing, so practice is a critical part of this, but 
um, we're on our way. So we're hoping that the plans for the future, I mean, you might speak to that, Rob, that we may get to a certification. It's just, it's a long process. No, I can, I can imagine. <laughs> yes. To do yes. that. Yes. I will mention though, that we have a big emphasis. We're big believers in <clears throat> what you might call community chaplaincy. Mm -hmm. And it's more of a lay ministry. You don't have to be board certified. We found that <clears throat> We've worked with a lot of people who they, they, chaplaincy may not, or spiritual care may not be their primary work, say a vet, but right. a vet who's trained in some of these techniques and who understand these concepts, or even yourself. I mean, you work with people and their animals. You know, we had a cat behaviorist who took our program and, you know, it really helps you do your job better. I'm sure. And I think yeah. for, it would be amazing for vets to take your course, I think. Right. So amazing, especially because they're obviously the ones in the room when people's pets are, are passing. So I think that would, that would be amazing. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So we just want to make this accessible to people. We've had other folks who with no prior experience, just took the training and ran and started a pet ministry at their church, mm -hmm. running pet loss support Aww. groups. So, you know, it's really, uh, we really feel like you know, the long way from where it's a profession say, you right. know, bona fide profession, but it, this is a, a great place to start. I agree. Yeah. Can, can you kind of share what a typical day in your work looks like? If you have a typical day, maybe you don't have a time. Well, you know, uh, that's changed for us. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I, I spent about two years at uh, the <laughs> at a, a large veterinary hospital, uh, veterinary teaching hospital as a, as a chaplain. Uh, t carried a pager, it's 24 hour on call. I was doing rounds uh, in the large and small animal hospital, spending time with folks in the quiet room, working with uh, faculty, students and staff and clients uh, who were uh, requesting support. You know, that's, that's one context. Others, uh, there are many other contexts, like you mentioned, you're a behaviorist. Uh, so for you, a, a typical day would be very different for right. say, somebody who's working in a, in a veterinary hospital. Uh, today, we spend a lot of time uh, writing and researching, but I still run a support group and I've been running this uh, through the SPCA, our local SPCA, for almost 19 years. And, um, you know, that, uh, that group, uh, you know, is a really uh, useful place for people to come who just need a, a listening ear. Others who have had the same experience, you know, I listen and try to get the story there. But for us, for, for now, it's our students who are really plugging in. And as mm -hmm. Karen mentioned, many of them are using it in their practices and using it in their churches. I think one of our primary audiences, what we hope to, folks that we hope to reach, are people in churches who love animals and want to support other members of the church or other members of the community. So that would be um, a context that we're really trying to support, at least initially with this. Right, I think that's such a lovely idea. How do you provide emotional support to pet owners who are dealing with the illness or loss of their pets? Or how do you rather, since you guys are focusing a little bit differently, how, how would veterinary chaplains provide emotional support? Uh, I guess the main thing, the top thing with with chaplaincy is just being a really good listener. Sure. And knowing how to listen and what to listen for. And, um, you know, it's kind of, <clears throat> chaplaincy is a different sort of practice. It's a very, uh, it's, it's actually based on um, counseling techniques developed by a, a psychologist named Carl Rogers, and it's mm -hmm. client focused. So it's very much driven by the needs of whoever the care seeker is. And your job is to learn to listen to how that person, um, you know, what happened? Who did they lose? What did that? And then that's where our storytelling method comes in. Mm -hmm. You know, what was your connection with that animal? And what kind of social support system do you have? But it's really, um, really, truly feeling heard by someone is an amazing experience. You know, in American culture, we're very fast paced. We're very kind of driven toward problem solving. I'm gonna solve this problem for mm -hmm. you. Grief and death are not what I would consider a problem you can solve. It's something that you just kind of have to, you know, death happens, we don't have control of it. Okay, how do we respond to this? And that's where possibly reframing if people get stuck in places where their, you know, guilt is a real common one. 
of that mm -hmm. endless cycle. What if, what if, what if, you know, if I'd only done this, things yes. would have done differently, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, a big part of this, because people are often very much surprised by how intensely they grieve, normalizing it, you know, that no, you're not crazy. You may feel like you're going crazy, but you're not crazy. This is just, this is what happens when we lose an important loved one. And pets are just so important. Absolutely. Such an important part of our lives. So, yeah, I, and I, I think that people are often shocked at, like you said, at the amount of grief that they feel, but our pets are with us in many cases, 24 seven, especially because so many of us are working from home now. And, and when we lose them, it really is such a big hole. It's, it's so difficult. I, yeah, we, we call that the loudest silence. Yes. I mean, it's just this, it's just, you feel like you've lost your home. Yeah. You, you know, and you're wandering in the wilderness. I mean, it's really a frightening experience and feeling afraid that you're not going to be able to handle it. How am I going to go on? How am I going to rebuild my life? What does the future look like without this right. animal that I was so, then you mentioned with you 24 seven and very often in your lap Yes, with, with the physical aspect. And that's, that's huge. It's huge. It is. It, it really it really is huge. But I lost my cat, Steve, who I considered my other half, whom even my wife knows. <laughs> he was my other half. I had him for 14 years and, and he was my true soulmate. And it's been like a year and some change now. And I think I'll struggle with it my entire life. I've tried so many things, like I've tried sound baths and meditations. And I went out west to the rocks to, you know, be with things that are ancient and old. And it's been such a, such an interesting journey of, of mm -hmm. trying to still connect with him and find him in a, some kind of spiritual way. I, I don't, I don't even know what I'm trying to say, but I just, I really sympathize with people going, going through this, especially with the animals they sort of consider their soulmates because it's such a deep and profound loss. It is. It's yeah. indescribable. He was a special relationship. Yeah. Yes. He was he really yeah. was my my other half. Yeah, we reckon that's an important point to to think about is that you know you can keep many many pets, but every now and then one will come along that for whatever reason you just have this bond with. Mm -hmm. And and we we hear a lot of stories about that. And um, sometimes it's the duration, like that animal has been with me through so much and was always there for me when I was going through other really rough times in my life and I could always count on that animal or just this real sense of attunement that you can't really yes. explain. And, and, anim and animals are amazing that way. Um, so yeah, it, it is. And actually the title of our first book is Heart Animals because we really, that's the soulmate, the heart animals mm -hmm. where it feels like you've lost part of yourself. Yeah. And it's, it is, it's really hard. And I hear you when you're trying to maintain, somehow hold on to that connection and nurture that connection. And that is important. Just, it's so weird. It's like when I, he was born in my house when I was like fostering his mom. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like, we just recognized each other immediately. It was mm -hmm. just like that, that was it. So mm -hmm. weird. I've never had a connection like that with, with any other soul. So anyway, can this I, podcast is not about me. Question? Yes, of course. Is, um, how is, is that special relationship you had relate to your work? Um, you know, it's funny. I was a fashion photographer for 20 years and, and I was when, you know, he was born in my studio and um, it wasn't until seven or years ago or so I was like, I don't want to be doing this anymore. And I had always been doing work with animals on the side as my way of giving back and, you know, being of service. And so that's that's why he and his mom and siblings and everyone were, were they were in my studio. Um, but then I reached a certain point in a certain age where I was like, Ugh, I can't participate in this this fashion world anymore and, and I thought really like I'd really like my my life to be more of service and and I realized oh, I could go back to school get my graduate degree in animal behavior and, and start doing this full time um, and and because of Steve he was very famous online because he used those speech buttons I taught him during COVID um, oh, oh wow <laughs> and but he was extremely bossy. He was probably one of the smartest people I've ever met. Like, so he learned immediately and was just very bossy. So he became very famous. Um, and that really, that really helped me be able to help more people because he built this platform around, you know, him. I was never in the videos, but it was very helpful to bring more awareness to behavior and to, to be able to launch this podcast and do all of these things. He was really like my partner in business also 
weirdly in my partner in outreach and when we did other wor like work with animals he was welcoming to any animal that we brought into the house um mm -hmm. to do foster work and and he was just really wow. the head of the the family so it's it's been tough for everybody in mm -hmm. the house um, wow that's amazing what a story yeah he was he was really the most amazing soul that i've ever met so it's it's been very difficult for me to even just like continue as a person without him. And your work honors him. That's what's what keeps me going. Yeah. It's been yeah. it's been difficult. And that was the same sort of thing we heard the stories that the vet techs shared was that they were doing this to honor their pets and their pets memories. It yeah. was it was the fuel that that love they had, that extraordinary experience of connection kept them going. Right. Yeah. And yeah. It, it's it's really amazing how animals shape our lives. It is. It really is. Um, and he really has created an amazing community that still is thriving. You know, all his followers are still very robust and, and amazing, wonderful, supportive people that support wow. our rescue work. So I'm so grateful for him. And all of his, his people are just the best people. So they're the people who listen to this podcast anyway. So <laughs> all, all thanks to Steve. What are some like rituals or ceremonies uh, that you may or may not offer for pets who are ill or who have passed away? Are, are there any things you can share that might be helpful for people? I could uh, start. Well, I, before I had, I, I do Zoom calls now for mm -hmm. my support group, but prior to that, I was meeting in person at the SPCA. And they gave us a, they were so nice. They gave us a little room to meet in and a uh, very nice weekly meeting. And uh, a couple times a year, we would have a, a service just to celebrate the lives of, of our, our animals. And um, we would do it in this big atrium, beautiful uh, setting there at the, uh, at the facility. And we would usually have about 20, 25, 30 people, and they would uh, briefly introduce their the pet to folks. Each would take a turn. And I always would pass out a little piece of paper, just a small square, a scrap of paper and a pencil or a pen to, to everyone, and ask them to write down a note to their pet. And it was either, you know, I love you, do you forgive me, or just, just a nice little message. And one at a time, folks would take that up to the front of the room. And we had a candle there, a big candle in a bowl. And they would light the piece of paper and drop it in the bowl. And the, the smoke would go up. And it was a very physical, tangible way of making connection with mm -hmm. your pet. And, and feeling as though you were communing with your animal. So that was that was a very helpful service. And we still uh, recommend that to folks. And many of the people that come to my support group have, have tried that and used that. But there are other things that can help. A lot of folks enjoy prayer, uh, sometimes a, a, a um, secular reflection. There are, mm -hmm. there are a number of really good writers, and we're putting some of those resources in our books. So prayer can help. But one of the things that really can help a lot is uh, journaling. Hmm. If you just keep a daily journal and write down things that you think of, things you remember about your pet, uh, things you want to say to them, you can write them down. And also building a shrine. A, a shrine is a very important part of the uh, process of acknowledging that value and meaning that, sh that that pet brought to your life. So, you know, there are various different kinds of shrines you can build, but it's all very unique and special for every person and pet. So... Those yes. are some of the things that we've come upon. You think of more? Mm -hmm. and that's the only ritual I can think of. Um, well, there is another one. Now, we've never done this, but it might be kind of interesting to hear. This is actually from Japan, mm -hmm. a big pet-loving country. Yeah. And um, has it's Buddhist, typically Buddhist, but it has Shinto, which is right. kind of indigenous um, spiritual tradition. So it's tempered in that way. But I, there's, there's a wonderful book called Bones of Contention by a religious study scholar, Barbara Ambrose. And one of the th rituals that they have is that when, say, a cremation, but the, the bones remain intact, mm -hmm. and there's these large urns that they have, large. For, see, one by one, you might put family members or whoever's at the ceremony would you know, take and put a bone in the urn. And mm -hmm. the very last bone, it's interesting, the very last bone to go into the urn is the voice box, the voice. Mm. 
So it's just a, I just always found that really fascinating that that would be the very last to go into the earnest, the idea of representing that animal's or that loved one's voice. Right. And the, they call that bone the Buddha bone. And the reason they call it the Buddha bone is if you set it up on a little, on the table, it looks like a sitting Buddha. So they really feel special about their, um, about their animals. Yeah. And, and the Shinto shrines yeah. respect that and provide that service. I think the main thing is just to be creative. I mean, really, right. there's there's not a lot of, you know, formal traditions out there, so we're kind of creating them. Right. And you might find some tradition from another place that just you find personally appealing and uh, whatever's meaningful to you, that's the main thing. I mean, just make it a sacred, sacred moment. We have a story told to us by a vet who took our class. Um, mm-hmm. She's up in Detroit. She's a mobile vet with her own practice, and she said that uh, one of the most beautiful beautiful uh, service that she's ever experienced was when she arrived at the service they were in the forest and they were processing with candles and they came to a circle and they circled around a fire and everybody spoke about knowing their pet and it was just she said it was most one of the most touching and beautiful services she's ever been to so you know like Karen's saying we we have to be creative because you know we're kind of bootstrapping this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree. I think rituals and ceremonies are so important. If uh, we talk about anticipatory grief, yes. if in that time before a loss, when, when you are anticipating that, uh, many of our students create a bucket list, mm. you know, and will take their pet to places they know yes. they love. And do things with them. They Feed know them favorite love. foods. Yeah. Whatever it's going to be for that animal and whatever yeah. and whatever health situation yeah. they have that they can manage. Just to try to cre- create something. Yes. A, enjoy the time you have. And give yes. structure. Like you say, give structure mm-hmm. to, to right. your life and to your time. Right. Yes. Very important. It doesn't yes. mean, as you said, it doesn't mean you're not going to feel sad. But it gives you another way of, to... to Get busy and take action and do something meaningful. Yeah, I not to bring this always back to me, but that's you know I have too much experience with this unfortunately recently. Uh, that Steve had a very aggressive cancer, uh, and so for three months he seemed normal, and then it just got worse and worse. You know, so we knew he was sick, but he still he seemed okay, which was very strange to confront to see your best friend and know he was going to be dead soon very weird so the anticipatory grief i think is so awful it's so awful and it's something that is not talked about a lot and then towards the end you know he had a feeding tube because he was still running and playing but we he couldn't eat anymore but we created like you said a plan we call it the fuck it plan and it was just that he was allowed to do whatever he wanted so he could go run in the woods because we didn't have to worry anymore about lyme disease or you know He could do, he could eat as many Doritos as he wanted and grow up, you know, whatever he wanted to do. Uh, He loved to go for long walks. And so he, you know, walk up to neighbor's houses because he was so confident. He thought every house was his house. And he just, (laughs) it was, it was such a heavy, sad time, but it was also in many ways, such a connecting, joyful time because we really focused so much on him. And the other cats also obviously knew he was ill. I'm sure that he smelled different. They could smell the cancer I'm sure and they were also surrounding him and hugging him all the time and and really being there for him and so there were so many beautiful moments that I think because we had the structure and we were like what can we do for Steve today that's gonna like be extra fun it really did help what was a truly incredibly difficult time right right so that's that's great one more thing before we move on just think about there are so many milestones in our lives with our pets. So welcoming ceremonies, adoption ceremonies, even if, you know, sometimes pets have to be relinquished against the, the pet keeper's will. You know, older people struggle with this if, say, they have to move into an assist, they have to leave their home yes. and, and they go to a facility that doesn't allow pets. And so rehoming pets, you know, any of those occasions, it, it's important. I think it is helpful to mark them with some kind of simple ceremony. Yeah, I I absolutely agree. I think we should talk about okay spirituality and actually yes. in terms of what chaplains do. Sure, because I think there is some misperception. Okay, um, you know most people have never encountered a chaplain, and if they have, it was in a hospital maybe. Right, right? and so you know you think oh it's 
you know, maybe it's Christian, maybe it's potentially evangelical, they get nervous about it because there's a lot of people who aren't religious or they consider themselves spiritual, not religious, or they're atheist, whatever. Right. And we really are very sensitive to the fact that people have lots of different cosmologies, lots of mm -hmm. different ways of framing their understanding of this world, this incredible world that we live in. So we try, we are interfaith chaplains, meaning that we're prepared to work with anyone, regardless of their faith tradition, or whether they identify as spiritual, not religious, or some other, maybe they're Wiccan, mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know, that that's really growing in popularity. A lot of the earth focused yes. spiritual traditions are kind of regaining, surging back sort of mm -hmm. thing. Death raises a lot of questions for people, you know, what happens to our pets when they've passed? What right. happens to them? Are they, do you still feel your pet's presence? That's very common. That's where we think that chaplains have something special to offer because we are open to a spiritual conversation and it is a conversation. Mm -hmm. It really is, well, let's take some time to think about this. What do you think happens? You know, it's not about what we might believe. It's really up to the person who you know, has, has suffered the loss. Right. I've, I've got a story. Yeah, about please. That. When I was chaplain at the vet school, there was a lady and she'd been referred to me and actually referred to me by her psychologist who called the vet school and she lost her pet at the vet school. She was seeing her psychologist and the psychologist couldn't help. And he reached out at the vet school and said, look, you know, who's your chaplain? I got my number, reached out to me, and asked if it would be okay if she called me. And I said, it would be fine. I didn't know about this lady. Well, she called me, and she started to tell me her story. And she said, um, well, my husband died a year ago, and just last month I lost my cat. And they were really good friends. And she said, you know, sometimes I'm sitting on the couch like I would sit with my husband and my cat, and we'd watch TV, and just the other day I was sitting there, and I felt her jump on the couch. Hmm. Am I going crazy? And I said, oh no, that's a, that's a common experience. And then, I, and then she said, and she started to whisper, and she said, do you think they're in heaven together, my husband and my cat? And I said, and I whispered back, I said, what do you think? And she said, I think they are. And I told her, I said, I think you're right. And she it was this long silence and she said, thank you, I think I'll be okay. That's all she wanted to know. Yeah, it's a nice story. I think psychologists and psycholo psychiatrists from my experience are not quite equipped to know what to say in these situations. In fact, my own have just said outright, I don't really know how to help you. You know, they want to, but I think they just don't know how to handle this so i think it's it's wonderful that veterinary chaplains are now more well known and and pet loss grief counselors are starting to become a thing mm -hmm. because it is it's just so underserved and and like the woman in your story people just want to be heard and acknowledged yes and and it can be so difficult to find someone and i think especially in our western culture it's so solution oriented and it's true. Your friends and your family will drop off after a week or two. I had people say to me like, you're still sad, you know, like just shocked. And I was like, yes, it's like someone chopped off half my body. You know, yeah. it's, I'm going to be sad forever. Yeah. So right. maybe you gain your functionality back, but that's right. There's always an absence. I'll never not be sad. That's right. Right. That's um, right. and so I think it's just, it's really great that, there are more people here to, to help and to do that outreach. And I'm, I th really appreciate you sharing that story. I think it's going to really resonate with a lot of people who are listening. And that kind of leads me to, to ask you like how you navigate the conversations about the afterlife of pets, especially if the pet owner holds certain religious or spiritual beliefs. Well, I guess really it's just having, um, in one of the books in our series, the one that's focused, focused on practice, mm -hmm. um, we do include a long section where we talk about uh, teachings about animals in the mainstream faith traditions. And, and then we also include a similar discussion about alternative spiritual practices and atheism and cosmology and spiritual but not religious. So I think that, you know, if you're have a basic understanding of how these faith traditions frame what happens to living beings after 
the physical body is gone, really, you can work with anybody. You may not right. be an expert in their spiritual beliefs, but you don't have to be because they are. It's really a matter of opening the conversation, knowing how to ask those kind of questions that help them really look deep and think about it and really, you know, articulate what they believe and all of it is a matter of faith you know mm -hmm. there's no well i not there's no need to to prove it you know right. in our science driven world they're just two completely different things and uh, i'll mention say in western society in a christian based society i think very often our religious lives are in you know if assuming you're religious maybe your religious life is one part of your life and your pets are another I mean, there's just not a lot of, sadly, not a lot of discussion, um, you know, in our churches about animals and our right. relationship with animals. And given the, the rise in pet keeping and the intense bonds that people are forming with their pets, I mean, they're family members, there are babies, there are soulmates, like you're saying, I think that maybe there's that's beginning to change, that there's a realization, like we get calls from, from ministers who they haven't kept pets, they don't really understand it, but they're like, something's going on here. I mean, I have so many of my congregants, you know, really grieving intensely for the animals, and I don't know, like your counselor, I don't know how to yeah. respond, right? You know, we, we talk a lot about empathy, mm -hmm. like, you know, empathy's the be all end all, and certainly that's wonderful when you can truly empathize with someone's perspective, but we kind of argue that sympathy is more important because you may not have really, I mean, beliefs about animals very widely in our society. Right. And, you know, we talk about having two impulses, imagination and generosity. So I'm going to try to imagine what your experience like is like, even if I haven't experienced it myself. And I'm going to be generous in terms of saying, well, I see that this is really important to you and trying to operate from that always from a position of compassion. Basically, if you can start there, you can't go wrong. Yeah, absolutely. How has working as a veterinary chaplain kind of impacted your own personal views on life and death and relationships with animals? If you want to get into all of that, I know it's like a really loaded question. That's a great question. <laughs> well, is that for me? <laughs> Tell me everything. Well, um, it's transformed my life. You know, like I said, my mom was the the pet keeper and the, the pet lover. And I've had pets in my life and some I've loved very well. But doing this work and, and talking to so many people that love pets, love their animals and have, have lost really special animals. Uh, it has it has changed my heart. It has given me a sense that we are all one. And some of the recent research, and I really respect your work, Christina, uh, some of the recent research in animals is, is moving into this area of the umwelt. You understand the animal's perspective. And that's the biggest change for me, is that I've really started to tune in to what is what is good for this animal, and not so much from my perspective, from what they call an anthropocentric right. stance, you know, what's good for them from their perspective. And that's a hard thing, and I've seen some of your work, and I'm very impressed with, oh. with your ability to do that. And you have a real gift. Thank you. And so that's the thing I'm starting to notice. It's just really understanding and tuning in from that perspective, from the animals. Yeah. I'll add to that that for myself personally, it's very much the same sort of thing. It's been a real awakening. I mean, I've always loved animals. They've been a part of my life. But to really understand and with the research and that we've done and the stories and all the people we talk with, they are essential to us. I mean, we're animals. Right. Yep. You know? <laughs> We are. That's we're primates. One. Yes. I mean, we, we sometimes try to pretend that, oh, we're, there's just those animals and then there's us. And it's like, no, folks, we are animals. Yes. And I think when you realize that and embrace that, it's just, it's wonderful. And so even like we both are big nature lovers and, you know, and I'm a big gardener and the, we live in an urban area, you know, we're not surrounded by wild animals or anything other than squirrels and rabbits, <laughs> birds and some snakes. But, you know, it's like when a, when a squirrel steals one of my tomatoes, I'm not thinking of that squirrel as, oh, that darn squirrel. I yeah. would have passed. I'm like, well, there's my neighbor squirrel. <laughs> 
And, you know, uh, there's plenty to share. And so it's really just this sense of, it's a shift of really thinking of my own animalness and my connection with all the life that's around me that I think when we get all caught up in our very busy human lives that are just the human stuff that we have going on, you can kind of forget that. And I think that our pets can help us help us bridge that disconnect that we might Mm -hmm. feel from the natural world. And and what a wonderful, wonderful thing. And so, yeah, it's really radically changed our lives. I mean, we could go on at length, too, about how contemplating death, not something we all necessarily want to talk to, but we spend a lot of time talking about it and thinking about it. you know, when you when you do that, that also is transformational. Maybe it's not quite as scary. Yeah. It's, you know, it's the bookends of our life. It's, it's you know, it's inevitable. Yeah. So we embrace it and we don't fight so hard against it. You do what you can, but then you there's a there's a lot of um, a lot to be gained by recognizing, you know, the cycle that we're all a part of. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Absolutely. I know. I think that it's like you said, I think it's so important to just recognize that like, oh, it's it's coming and it's maybe not such a big deal. And it's something everyone goes through it. Everyone has gone through it in the history of times. Well, it's, it's a cultural thing to some extent. You know, we, we hide death in our culture. Yes, we do. And everything's death and illness. Yeah. But even well, birth, everything is removed from the home now. Everything medical right. is removed from the home. And it's so strange that we just live this like very sanitized, bizarre mm-hmm. life. Right. I, and we don't even show old bodies. On, no. You know, it's I mean, just... It's, it's really, it's, it's bizarre, uh, it's, I think. And I think it's unhealthy and, you know, right. And as a consequence of that, it becomes this big, this big fearful thing. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be. I, I agree. I, well, here's a tip. This, uh-huh. is, this is an important um, aspect of, of, of grief and loss that uh, we talk about in our book. And it comes out of um, recent psych literature. Um, but thoughts of thoughts of death do something subconscious to human beings and we know this from from the research and what what that does is it raises our anxiety and we may not even know that we've had this trigger you know maybe we saw something on tv maybe somebody told us about something that happened to them maybe we had a scare Our, our pet is going through some difficulty and we have thoughts of death you know and um their death but those it's the animal is, is part of you. It's it's so close that when you when you're triggered by a serious illness by your pet, those thoughts come up, and but you don't know that that your anxiety is is gone up. It just happens to you. And in our society, the way we react to that unconscious anxiety is we buy stuff. <laughs> we, when the tough get when the going gets tough, the tough go shopping, and that's a true. That's true. And it's yeah. true because that's how we deal with anxiety. And you think about this for a minute. What if you're at the vet hospital and the vet tells you this bad news? The first thing that happens, unbeknownst to you, is you're highly anxious. And so knowing, as chaplains, as we do as chaplains, that this is, a, this is a very debilitating moment for a person, they're very likely to want to throw money at a problem. And so that's sometimes, you know, what we what we recommend in those times, you know, if if you're talking to somebody and say, oh, I just got a bad diagnosis, what do I do? We take a person aside, and if we've we've learned through through our study that if you just take 20 minutes and have a cup of coffee and just sit with somebody who's good at listening, that lowers your anxiety level, and that will help you make a better decision that's better for your pet and better for you. And so we don't talk about this detail to folks when we help them, you know, about the research and all that stuff. Right. What we do is we take them for a cup of coffee. And so, but we know that it gives them a better chance to make the decision for them and for their pet that, that serves both. That makes a lot of sense. And that's, it's very interesting and not really surprising, I think. <laughs> so I want to ask you guys a few listener questions that we got. Um, the first is, my soul cat passed too soon due to a misdiagnosis. I still harbor anger towards the vet. How can mm. I let go? Yeah, that's a tough one. Mm. Anger and guilt. Yes. They're kind of 
two sides of the same coin, you know, because mm -hmm. guilt is anger directed at yourself. And those are very, very powerful emotions. They're important emotions. We should not deny and try to suppress those feelings. But, you know, when it starts to kind of hang on and hang on and hang on and you can't let it go, you start to realize that you're really just, it just hurts you in the long run. Right. You know, the vet, I don't know what the listener's interaction was with their vet. If they were met with a brick wall, I mean, it happens. Um, we've heard stories of, like that of animals that missed diagnosis or surgery that was supposed to go smoothly and the animal passed and, you know, stories like that. And unfortunately, it can be a problem because animals are property legally and they're really, there's no recourse. Yeah. There really isn't. And um, that makes it hard, the injustice of it. And I, I hear the injustice of it, of not having anything that you can do to address this problem. But I mean, ultimately, that comes down to it. What can you do? So, um, you know, I think writing a letter to the vet doesn't mean you have to send it. Talking with people, sharing your story, finding support, self-care. You know, it's ultimately a, a self-compassion to try to forgive. Yeah. Well, I, I want to respond to the listener, too. Anger is, is one of the five stages that uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross identified. You know, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Now, these are very good. It's a very good way of seeing really more of the initial reactions in a time of a loss. You get angry. You want to deny, but over time, and I want the listener to know that over time, things will get better. And what we know now from the, from the literature is that there's another way of seeing this loss experience. It's called continuing bonds. The continuing bonds can be expressed in a number of ways, and this happens over time, but you might have dreams of your pet. You might dream a dream. You might uh, create a shrine or memorial. You might actually, you know, like the cat jumping on the couch, you might sense the cat in your, in your home or around you in your presence. These are all what's, what are called continuing bond expressions or the expressions of this continuing love that you still have. Your love will never die. And I know it's sometimes a fear that you'll forget your pet, and, but I can assure you, you won't. And over time, one of, the, one of the continuing bonds that we've identified in the research that I did was call, is called generativity. And, I, and that's why I asked you how your loss of Stephen affected your work. Mm -hmm. What we find, almost to a person, that when we've had an intense loss like this, ultimately it comes out as a gift of love to the people we know. And to animals. And to, the, and to their animals, and to animals in general. So we, we want to, to console the listener and, and help them understand that in the fullness of time, that love remains. That's a lovely answer. Thank you. Someone else asked, where can I find sacred writings about the loss of a pet from any spirituality? That's a difficult question because yeah. there isn't... Uh, there is a, a book I would recommend. It's a scholarly book. It's a scholarly work, but it is very thorough. It's called uh, Animals and World Religions, mm -hmm. and it's by uh, a religious studies scholar Lisa Kimmerer is her name. And um, that was really valuable for us as we were preparing our own book, and our, which we, we hope to publish probably next summer or fall, where we kind of have a synopsis of uh, sacred teachings about animals, you know, in the world's mainstream faith traditions. But there's a lot of popular books out there. But common question is, will I see my animal again? Right. And so it's, there's, there's some really interesting works, um, one by uh, find Jack Wentz. Um, <clears throat> one, Will I See My Dog in Heaven? He's a Franciscan Friar. And then there's a website I would recommend called Creature Kind. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's also, I think it tends to be more Christian in focus, but it also has lots of resources um, around uh, sacred teachings around animals. All right. 
Thank you for that. Then someone else wanted to know a personal question, which is, do you believe that we can somehow commune with our beloved animals after they pass? Well, having been raised Catholic, I can speak from my personal <laughs> experience that <clears throat> there is a choir and they're constantly giving me counsel and barking and meowing and chirping to me from somewhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I just personally think that uh, the spirits of our loved ones do remain. I mean, that's just my personal experience and yeah. my personal belief. All right. Karen, do you have anything you want to add to that or? To that one? Same, same. Same, same. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> There's just, there's so much, you know, things that happen that are just like, wow, really what is going on here? I mean, remarkable stories that it's like, how are you going to explain this? You just can't from a reason, from <laughs> logic doesn't explain it. So yeah, I think it's, it's beautiful to embrace that idea. It's a beautiful thing. You know, life doesn't end with death. Yeah. Um, and the last listener question was, how is best to honor our pets after we lose them? And I know we've talked about that a lot already. I don't know if there's anything that you want to add. Well, um, <clears throat> paying the love forward. Yeah. I mean, really, that's what it comes down to. Our animals just give us so much love, so much, such gifts that they give us. And if we can find ways to pay that love forward and spread it around the world, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a great to honor their spirits, their beautiful spirits, to make things better for people and for animals, you know. So find what appeals to you. I mean, you're doing remarkable work, and I know that S Steve and the love and the intense connection you had with him is a, is a part of that, to help you continue doing this work. Um, there's all kinds of, of ways. You know, it may just be as simple as trying to be a more tolerant person. You know, we're all judgy humans. <laughs> it's really hard for, you, yes. for, for people not to be judgmental. But, you know, we talk about unconditional love with our animals. Really, mm -hmm. it's not judgmental love. I mean, really, that's what they accept us even when we're, you know, not in our best form. They and they do. love us no matter what. So that's a really great model. You know, we think about how animals, you know, how, what can we learn from our animal teachers? I like to frame it that way. You know, well, you said that um, you asked me, you know, how our work has changed me. Mm -hmm. I said that it has transformed my heart. And that's true for, for all pet owners, for pet keepers. They change us. They change our heart. And so if you want to know how best you know, to honor them, it really springs from that transformation formed person you are. And it's a mystery. We don't know. I mean, who knows how it will play out in time, but I believe that the animal has something to say about that. And if we listen, we'll know. So for you, it, it, it came out in, in this special way that you're able to talk to people like us, you know. But everybody's different and every experience is different. So I would just like to know what ends up happening with this listener. I would love to know the good and the lovely thing that happens in the world Yeah. as a result of that love. Yeah, I think those are wonderful, wonderful answers. So how, if people want to contact you, if they want to work with you or other pet chaplains, how do people go about doing that? Well, our mm. website is um, petchaplain.com. And right now, that um, really what's there is just some information on our book series. Mm -hmm. You can sign up to get an email when the book series is published. Um, there's also information on there about the pet loss support group that Rob want, runs mm -hmm. via Zoom. So that information is there as well. And um, we do have, if you feel like you really need to speak with someone one-on-one, -on -one, we have some graduates of our program who are willing and able to talk with you. And, um, you know, just reach out in the, via our contact form and we'll get back to you, you know, if, we, if you need a referral. Yeah. Right. And we just really hope that, you know, with our book series, we're envisioning, you know, you don't have to be interested in the practice of veterinary chaplaincy. That's just one of the books. It right. really is what we consider kind of a spiritual journey. So we really ask, you know, really engage people to reflect on their relationship with their animals and how those animals have changed their life. We look at the social experiences that we have and culturally in contemporary Western society, we cover a lot of ground. So it's really kind of a thorough 
referral way if you really want to, you know, in forming a book study group. That's another thing that we think these books will lend themselves to because they all have questions in them asking you to think about, you know, what we're offering here. So, right. um, um, yeah, it's sparking conversation. That's really important. The more stories we can share with each other, the better. Agreed. All right. Well, I want to thank you both so much for talking with me today. I think this was so informative and and really touching and helpful conversation. And I think the work you're both doing is so valuable and will help so many people and does help so many people. So I'm, I'm so grateful you took the time out of your day to speak with me so that we can get this information out to more people. Well, thank you, Christina. It's been a pleasure. It really yes. has. And thank you for sharing your story. I know that's... <laughs> Of course, what? I'm always so happy to talk about Steve. He was the best, <laughs> the best person in the world. So well, I'm gonna go have to find him on Instagram. Oh, so. you can. He's he's the Daily Steve B on Instagram. He's easy to find. Um, so yeah, you can you can find him there. So thank. I just want to thank you guys again so much uh, for being on the podcast. And that's it. All right. Have, have a you. great day. All right. Thank you. Thanks for listening. As always, if you enjoyed the podcast, please go ahead and give us a rating and or a review. We'd super appreciate it. You can find our social medias, Instagram and TikTok at His Intel Podcast. For cat behavior consultations, go to catitude-adjustment.com. Music provided by Cat Beats.